Awesome. So I think we are live. All right. Hello, world. Hello, and welcome everyone to Food Photography Week here at BNH Photo. Um, my name is Yana, and I am with the amazing creative marketing team here at BNH. I am also here with Sam, who is going Hi. to start this week with us. But you know, I'm so excited about this week. This week means so much to me personally, as it touches upon something that I know and love so passionately with my own blog, with my own work. And as you all may suspect, it is an absolutely delicious field to work in, as Sam may attest to. <laughs> um, so starting today, we will be hosting four days of wonderfully talented photographers talking to their craft and skill set and provide really educational tools to help you all kickstart or elevate your food photography work. Also, these are all amazingly talented people who I would listen to speak any day of the week and have them provide insight to their own lives is just a privilege and an honor. So yay. Um, let's go over the schedule. Let's see if we have the schedule up. But start the schedule will be obviously starting today. Let's see. I can just go over it as well. So today we will have Sam Adler with technique and composition for food photography. Um, at 2 p.m. we will have Jenna Carlin talking to the secret of standing out as a food photographer, very important. And she's going to do a live demo, which I'm very excited about. On Tuesday tomorrow, we have Maria Perez talking about how she started cooking during quarantine and succeeded and had created her own book, which is like the most amazing thing. And I'm very jealous. And Alan Shapiro will be there talking Zen and delight, finding delight in food photography. Wednesday, we have Jessica and Steve Geralt. Steve is doing the perfect pour shot, which is the funnest thing to do in food. I need to stop saying food photography, <laughs> but you know it is this week. So Finally, Thursday, we will have our panel of food influencers with David, Jessica, and Remy all talking to Instagram and social platforms and how to succeed and just discussing it and trends that are out right now. And that is so integral to what we do now. It's very cool that we have them all there. And lastly, we will have a image critique with me and my colleague, Michael Hollander which I will get into right now because it is very cool that we're doing a, we're gonna do a sweepstakes for BH Food Photo Week. And then we will get to have you guys submit your own food photos on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag BH Food Photo Week. And then you get a chance to win a Fujifilm XS10 with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens and a transcend memory card. So in addition to that, we will also be picking out a handful of those photos for our critique. And that will be live on Thursday at 2 p.m. So let's jump into this. We are here with Sam and she is, I'm so excited. She is the best of the best. We are so happy to have her because you've seen any of her work in our promos, you'll know that Sam is just spectacular at what she does. And when I started my own food photography work, Sam's course was and remains to be the course to take if you wanted to elevate your look and or taken serious or be taken seriously in food photography. So I absolutely couldn't be any more honored to host her today. And Sam, I will take it over to you now. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for saying all those really, really nice things. I'm just sitting here in my one little office blushing to myself. <laughs> so thank you so much. i um, so excited to be here. So I'm just going to um, share my screen and we're going to get started because we have a lot to go over. So let's do this. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be going over technique and composition in food photography. Um, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on who I am. If you don't know me, my name is Sam Adler. 
I am a professionally trained pastry chef. I'm a food photographer and I run a baking blog over on frostingandfettuccine.com. And I started my photography business right after I started my blog in 2017. And since then have worked with major food brands, networks, and have been shockingly featured <laughs> in four national magazines. And in 2018, I won a Savoir blog award with like 6,000 Instagram followers. So if you're thinking that Instagram is all what you need to be successful, it is not, um, just to go to show you. I also, I started teaching food photography and styling two years ago through my coaching program, The Style Mastermind, um, which we can talk about towards the end of this. I'm also a wife and a mom to two little kids and I run my business out of my house, at my home studio and my office here in Hollywood, Florida. Okay, today what we're going over is in terms of technique and composition, we're gonna be talking about framing your shot with angles, our compositional techniques, balance in a photo, and we're going to be doing some homework. I'm going to give you guys some little uh, assignments that you can get together to do. And we're going to be talking about possibly working together if you were interested and some going over some um, any questions you might have about anything. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so before you begin any shoot, um, I want you to think about the best angle and the focus for the food that you're shooting. So you're gonna be thinking about, am I shooting this on a 45 degree angle? Am I shooting this straight on? Is the food, what is the best angle for the food that I'm shooting? Am I gonna be using an overhead shot? Am I gonna be using a macro or wide lens? And then if there are multiples, which honestly, if you wanna get the most out of your, sh your shoots, shooting multiple angles is gonna be really, really helpful for you. So think about which one you're gonna do first. So you can see here in, in these slides that this is all the same cake. Um, we have three different angles. So we have the 45 degree on the left, the overhead in the middle, and then the straight on shot on the right. So, you know, when you're doing something like this, you're gonna really think about what you're gonna be doing first. Generally, I go for the overheads and then switch on to the straight ons or the 45 degree angles. So you're gonna also be asking yourself, what lens am I gonna be using? If you're using a zoom lens, you know, you'll be able to go in and out. If you're gonna be using a macro lens, that's only gonna get you really good close-up details. And then if you're using a wider lens, um, just along these lists here, any of those that you're using, um, you're going to uh, have more in the frame than if you were gonna be using a macro lens. So thinking about your angles and the lenses that you're going to be using and kind of just thinking about the shots that you want to take are going to really be able to help you help you when you're setting up your shot. So here's just an example of a macro and a wide shot. So obviously in this macro shot, this was shot on a 100 millimeter camera and this wide shot was shot on a 50 millimeter. So just thinking about, you know, what is my setup? Like if I took my macro shot, my macro lens to this wide angle shot, it would be a completely different photo and you wouldn't have as many details or storytelling elements in there. So really just thinking about what your, what lens, what your lens capability is and thinking about what you want out of that is going to be able to really help you um, imagine or plan the shot that you want. Okay. So when we talk about composition, there is this woman, her name is Philippa Stanton and she's an artist. Um, and she wrote a book on composition and just like creativity. And she says that through composition, you guide someone's eyes and mind toward what you perceive to be the most important part of your piece. This is why it's so important for you to share, share your thoughts and your views on your photo because it doesn't really matter what anybody else is gonna think about it. You wanna show your viewer what you think is the most important part of your piece. And that's what composition is about. So good composition is a thing of magic which transforms ordinary objects and previously dull environments into thought provoking art. So if you really think about this, it's wonderful to think about you sharing your perspective on something and also to know that it doesn't have to be this insanely elaborate thing. It can be something that, you know, as we'll see towards the end, um, this, this um, shot of pistachio shells, where I just, you know, realized I really liked the colors and took a picture of that. And now it turned out to be one of my favorite photos. So it doesn't have to be this like, you know, crazy, subject. It could just be something really, really boring that you bring out through your eye and that you are able to share with people who are looking at your photos. So in terms of composition, so yes, there are a lot of 
rules and techniques, like all the things you see here on the left, patterns, lines, shapes, shadows, light, movement, height, space. But this is all combined with your imagination. So once you're familiar with these rules, quote unquote, I want you to use your imagination and your creativity to experiment and see what you come up with. So like once you kind of know the rules that that's when you can break it. Um, and the composition is not only rules, it's your rules plus how you are seeing it and your imagination and what you're bringing to the table for that. Okay, so we are going to start with some of the basics uh, and then we'll get into more deeper advanced co uh, composition and we'll have lots of um, examples to share with you. So let's get started. Okay, so firstly, we're gonna be thinking about working inside the frame. So a lot of times people will go and they'll set up their whole setup and they'll do all the, like put everything in different places and they'll love it and it's so pretty. And then they turn on their camera and they realize that nothing is in the frame. So you have to be able to kind of compose inside the frame. So you might have to take it a step back to do that. So we're thinking about what props do you want to be fully visible? What props or the food do you want just to have a glimpse of? So you can see here that I have like, you know, the strawberries cut off, this main one is in focus, these two in the back aren't in focus. So clearly I really wanted you to focus on this like drippy factor over here. Um, so paying attention to the parts of the food that are in focus and aren't in focus are going to be helpful. And part of the photo that's going to be in like, you know, your depth of field, paying attention to that. So how shallow your depth of field is, which is how blurry it is in the background or how much in focus the entire frame is going to be. And just make sure that you step back with the camera enough, far enough to make sure that you're composing inside the frame. So what that looks like. So this is just to give you an example. This is literally the number one mistake that I see people making is that they shoot too close up to their subject in terms of a storytelling shoot. And then they lose out on all this extra goodness and the storytelling and the compositional aspects of the photo. So it's a difference between this photo on the right where you would literally, your eye is going straight to the, the, the milk. When if you look at the, the picture on the left, you realize that really, it's not really about the milk. It's about this little chubby cute hand dipping an Oreo into the milk. So it's really thinking about what is my story? What's going on here? What elements do I need to fit inside the frame to make that story come out? And this is especially true if you want to post a photo on, on Instagram. Um, your Instagram is going to crop your photo to four by five. So you have to be even extra conscious of taking an extra step back. So I would even take an extra step back if you're posting this on Instagram, because a lot of times it'll just cut off the corners of your frame and then it won't be able to tell the story that you want. So just keep that in mind. Okay, let's start with the rule of thirds. This is something that's super common and I'm sure if you are a little bit even into your journey of photography, you already know this concept, but it's important to start here because a lot of things work off of this concept. So the rule of thirds is a grid of two intersecting lines that make up nine boxes. So we have, you can see here the intersecting points here and we have we place the props or the food on any of the intersecting lines, which is pleasing to the eye. Alternatively, you can set your main subject off center and along one of the lines. So, and as an example, you can see here, this is the rule of thirds grid on the left. Here is a photo without it. And then here is a photo showing you where the intersecting lines are. So you can see that this one is right on top of this gooey little line. The next line, this one is straight down right here on this line where I cut. And we also have this intersecting point here, which is on top of this little corner. And then we have one over here, which is right where these guys be. So thinking about these things and these concepts will allow you to immediately take your photos and just like level them up because you're putting them in a, in a grid that is just visually pleasing to the eye. So another example of the rule of thirds in a different way, which is, um, by using your space. So this image breaks up the boxes by having all the action in the bottom two thirds of the photo. And the top over here is just full of negative space. So you can see that the blueberries are in the center, but we're still using that uh, rule of thirds type rule where we're having all this busyness in the bottom two thirds and the top one third is just left there open so that it pushes your eye down to the, where all the action is. Okay. 
So now that we just touched on negative space, we're going to get more into it. So negative space isn't just like, oh, I just feel like not having any space here. <laughs> it's not, it's not actually what that is. Negative space is used to push the viewer's eye into the direction of the photo that has all the action or has placement or has props or things like that, which is actually called positive space. So it really helps to balance the photo out when there's a lot going on on one side. So you see here in this picture of peach muffins, you have all these um, muffins on one side, and then lift this side is just left open so that it pushes your eye to look up to these muffins. Here are some more examples of using negative space. This is using neg negative space on this landscape type image. And this is using neg negative space again in this portrait vertical image. So you see we have all this goodness and things happening down here. And we have all this white area just pushing more into the positive space. Okay, let's talk about the rule of odds. So <clears throat> working with odd numbers, like whether it's props or food, it just creates a more visually appealing image. So why is this? It's because when you work with even numbers, your brain is trying to group it into pairs. So instead of looking at each element of the photo individually, you're seeing it as a grouped as a whole. So when you have the odd numbers, it creates a middle point. If, you're, if you have even numbers, there is no even, there is no middle point, there's no middle ground. So with the odd numbers, because it creates this one middle point, that becomes your focus point. And it allows for you just to have that really beautifully visually pleasing image. So to make it easier, you can just think about framing your main subject by two other subjects. So this is just like one type of compositional technique is just placing two other subjects on either corner and placing your middle subject or your main subject in the middle and thereby using the rule of ads. So when we're using the rule of odds, <clears throat> this was shot for um, a chocolate candy client that I had. Um, and there was a lot, <laughs> there were a lot of eggs. There was a lot and it's hard to make a lot of little things look good. So if you have smaller subjects like blueberries or chocolates, you can always bunch them together into groups of three or five. And that way, even though there's a lot of something, you're still able to group them into odds and make them look more cohesive by grouping them together. So I would stick to working with either three or five um, because after that, your brain is gonna start seeing them as a group already. So just work with a lower amount, either three or five work best because after that, it just gets a little crazy. So here's some more examples of the rule of odds. You can see here we have three cups and we have five, um, mini ice cream cones. We have three tarts here. We have three lemon pieces here. And you can see this image with the pasta is essentially the same exact image as the key lime pies as before, um, just reversed. So remember we had the key lime pie in the middle and we had one over here and we had one over here. This is the same image with pasta, just on a different side here. So it's essentially just using that technique to allow you to create this um, symmetry in the image that will immediately allow you to just be like, oh, that's really great. Um, okay, moving on to leading lines. So leading lines create movement and they add direction and energy into your composition. So paying attention to the shapes of the lines that are created from each element in your composition and where it leads to is super important because it creates those visually appealing images. So especially when you're using a bunch of these elements on top of each other, like the rule of odds or leading lines and all these things and negative space or whatever, and you're kind of grouping them together, obviously you're not just gonna be shoving different compositional techniques in there just for the sake of it, but when you're able to layer them together and you see that they make sense, it creates just more of that visually more appealing image. So when we're talking about leading lines, the point of the line is to direct your eye through the image moving around up and down and around the image, or it's going to show you directly to what the focus point of the image is. So when you're creating these lines, you can create them with props, with light, food, like using a knife or the edge of a cutting board, which I'll show you. Um, and then when you use them on a diagonal, they really move your eye through the entire photo. So 
And like I said before, the line should either be all directing your eye to the main subject or leading your eye through around the whole photo. So let's look at some examples here. So this is again, those little mini, mini lime tarts you could see. So these guys, um, when I was shooting them, you can see that I had, I had this white chocolate that I was gonna drizzle. And I was like, I don't know, what should I do with this white chocolate? Should I just like drizzle like crazy? And I was like, no, I'm not gonna drizzle like crazy. I'm gonna make, a, like, make it make sense. So I drew, drizzled some this way, and then I drizzled some this way, and then I drizzled some this way. So that it leads your eye up and around the photo here. And you can see, that I have four tarts here. So that's not the rule of odds, but I have three, only three that I decided to a drizzle of chocolate. So you're able to kind of work around, like I said before, the compositional rules are here to guide you. They're not here as those rules as like, you have to do this. Like, no, you don't. And once you figure out how to do it, you can know how to break the rules or you can kind of do something like this where you're, hey, you're saying, hey, I have four tarts, but I'm only going to drizzle three of them with chocolate. So that way it brings out the rule of odds. Another example here is the one in the middle where I didn't specifically really add specific lines like I have here, I made, a, I drew a line. So here I don't really have any specific lines. It's more of like the placement of the, of the props and placement of the food that created these lines. It created this line of negative space and it just kind of draws your eye around the photo um, in this picture here with all these oranges. And then in terms of using props like parchment paper where this creates a line in and of itself, you can see this line here and this line are pointing to this bite shot over here, which is like the wow factor part of the image. And that's like where your eye is going. So when you're working with these leaning lines, it's really important to pay attention to just like, how can I create it with an actual line? And then how can I create it like, like objectively without the actual line. So it's just like thinking about it, using your imagination, figuring it out. And a lot of times you'll think about one thing and then you'll realize that something else is working along with it. Um, so just keeping your eye open and just paying attention is just super helpful. We can go more, this is more like a little bit more of an advanced leading line situation. So we have here, we have these are Italian rainbow cookies before I cut them into a million little pieces. So they are delicious, by the way. Uh, so here we have this line over here of the cake. So I, would, I wanted to take a picture, like a process shot of something, but I didn't want it to be boring. And I was like, okay, what can I do with this? So I cut it into lines. I was like, okay, you know what? Let's make these going in different directions. So you have this little guy over here to show you, hey, this is what it's going to be like but this is the process of what I'm doing. And so I move this guy this way and we have the knife pointing up and we have this guy going this way, this guy going this way. And you can see it just kind of goes all the way out. And we can see that I also have this sheet pan here that kind of helps with another line. And you can see the lines here. And then this is the photo just by itself. So it just, you know, you can make things that sometimes they seem like I have no idea what to do with this and then just have one compositional technique that could really, really help you and turn out into a photo that you really like. Okay, so we have more leading lines. See, I just, I think this is one of my favorite um, compositional techniques to use, if you can't tell. So, okay, we have a lot of freaking lines happening here. So we have all the lines happening from the actual cookies once they are cut. And so we have, first of all, this parchment paper that kind of acts as a frame inside the frame. And we have these little cuts that are happening. So we have not only the lines from the actual cookies, but we have the line from the knife, which is going up this way. And you can see how all the cookies are with their lines are pointed in, in this direction. They're all pointed in this direction. So I want your eye to go up. And then we have the chocolate that's leading your eye this way and this way, and then this guy is pointing this way. So it just, it just takes a lot of thinking um, to be able to just, you know, how can I get my viewers' eyes to move around the photo? What can I do to it to just enhance it? So if my, if my cookies were faced in a different way, this, this photo would have a completely different uh, feel to it. And especially even these guys are placed on the diagonal. This is placed on the diagonal. If I had turned it to the right, 
it would have been a completely different photo and probably wouldn't have made it such an impact. Like it wouldn't move your eye up and around. It would just kind of like stay right there straight. So um, just thinking about the different directions that you can take is going to be helpful. Okay, so now that we're talking about lines, there's something called dynamic tension. So what this is, is you are creating and using energy to create movement in a photo that leaves the viewer's eye around the photo instead of coming to a point. So remember how I just was talking about if I had kept this area and this area and turned them straight, it would have just come to a halt and it was stopped. So that's what you don't wanna do with dynamic tension. You don't wanna do that. So let's say a good example here is having these two spoons. You know, when you're plating things, you're just like, I don't know where to put the spoons. I don't know where to put the plates. I have pie places, I don't know where to put it. So this is gonna be super helpful because you don't want to have the two spoons just pointing at each other because essentially what this is doing, you're creating these two lines and your eye is going right here. And there is nothing to look at right here. There's nothing to look at. This is not exciting. You don't need your viewer's eye going here. The whole point is that you want your viewer's eye to go up and around the photo and focus on the most important parts. This is not an important part. <laughs> there is nothing to see here. So when you have these two spoons coming at each other, the energy stops. So you have nowhere else to go versus if you do something like this, see how simple and so much easier your eye is to move around because you're going this way. And then you're like, oh, what's this way? So you're looking at it in kind of like um, a different, completely different way. And you're instead of having to just stop right here. And it's such an easy fix. All you have to do is turn the plate and turn the spoon. It's all you have to do. So you could see how just placing your props can have such a different impact when you're not um, forcing them to stop and point at each other. You're making your eyes with the lines move up and out and around the frame. So I hope this is a little bit of a helpful thing when, cause I know plating and dealing with slices and a lot of forks and spoons is really, really confusing sometimes. So this will definitely be helpful. Okay, another way we can talk about composition is creating movement in a photo. So aside from like actually creating movement, like, you know, pouring something or like, you know, dusting something like that, you can create other kinds of movement. So implied movement, which is like working with triangles or working with curves or capturing mo movement. This is using your props to lead the eye. So when you're working with triangles, this helps to keep your eye moving around the photo, which is what we're talking about, which is what you need you know, what you want to do. So we're working in threes because rule of odds. So it's visually appealing and you can kind of see how many that you can make to keep the movement going. So when you're working with triangles, you can't just like connect three things and be like, oh, it's a triangle. <laughs> they have to be similar shapes or items for it to make it work. So for example, um, you can see here that I have six cakes in the, um, in the photo. And again, that's not the rule of odds, but if I have three here and three here, that is the rule of odds. And I'm using triangles when I'm placing multiple things down, I'm using triangles to keep it cohesive. And you can see here, this is a little bit of a harder thing to do, but you know, when you're doing straight on, you can still work with triangles. I place this one in the back, this one in the front and this one on the side. So it works like this. And you can see all three of them in that triangular shape. I also have these muffins. So I'm not just like, hey, whatever, I'll just take what I, I'll just take any piece out. Like, no, you're gonna think about it. And I say, okay, if I take this one out and I take this one out and take this one out, then I'll be able to have that triangular effect and it'll be able to make sense instead of just randomly taking out different shots, different cupcakes or muffins or whatever it is, it's thought out. And so it makes sense and it creates this visually pleasing image. Okay, working with curves. So creating an S curve. So this creates movement in, implied movement in the photo, leading your eye up and down. So you can use food, props, linens, plates, anything to kind of create this effect. Um, well, which will just like add this movement to your photo and it leads the eye up and around and it's exciting. You're like, oh my God, there's so many things in here. What should I look at first? So you can see here that um, even the, the cake slices here are placed on the curve. I didn't just like place them down to go straight. Like I placed them down on the curve and it all makes sense because it all flows like this. You can see the S here and it doesn't always just have to be an S. It doesn't have to be an S. It just a curve, but this one is called an S curve. You can see another example here. This is just using the S curve with the linen. 
And then this is more of an S curve that you, uh, that you can see is very minimal, but doesn't mean that you don't use composition techniques, you still use them. Um, and you can see here that I placed, not only just did I use the S curve, but I was able to be like, hey, how can I break up this photo? So I have one Oreo over here that's you know broken apart. And then I have another one here. And then the next one is bitten in over here. So if you connected these three, you would have that triangle here. Um, but it also allows you to have this S shape to create this composition. Okay, so now that we covered some basics, let's try and get a little bit more advanced because there's always some more exciting things that we can go over. So we have the golden ratio. So this is a ratio that's based um, off of one to 1 1.618. So we'll show you in the next slide, but each box in this golden ratio is going to be 1.618 larger than the smaller one. So it's very visually pleasing. And it's like, if you think about um, this circular shell, that's what you can find in nature, that's a golden ratio. And we're so attracted to it because you're like innately attracted to it because it's found in nature. So you can use the golden ratio in a different, a few different types. You can use it in the golden triangle, the golden spiral, a phi, the phi grid and some other cropping tools, which I'll show you. But if you go into Lightroom and you're in your develop module, you go into the crop tool and press O, that will be able to bring you up all the um, <clears throat> all the compositional grids that will show you, and you can crop your photo into um, a, the, one of these ratios that will immediately make it look pretty. So let's go over what this is. So here's the Fibonacci spiral, the golden ratio. So these are the boxes that I was talking about before. So I'll show you some examples, but these are the compositional techniques where you're going to base your photo around. Um, you have your phi grid and you have the golden triangle, which happens to be my favorite. So we'll, I'll, we'll show you some examples. So this is your Fibonacci spiral. It is found a lot in nature. You could do like, if you see like a seashell or you see those like spirals of like cauliflower, that those are green spirals. Those are all these golden ratio spirals. So the part of composition with the most detail should be placed in the smallest area here and it leads your eye up to the rest of the photo. So you also don't have to always have your curve here. It could be rotated, it could be flipped, it could be horizontal, but just pay, paying attention to the way things move around the spiral is going to be helpful, but you don't have to be like literal and place like things only around the line. It's just used as a guide. So some examples here are, you could see this watermelon photo. So I have the most um, detailed stuff happening down here. And then it kind of works its way up and around the photo. Um, you can see the whole lines here. And then we have this over here is kind of the same thing. So we have the, we have the lemon tarts or lemon squares or lime squares, whatever these are. We have this little thing happening over here and then it, it goes up and around. So you're not really seeing like, I'm not placing a, a lime on every single thing here because you don't need it to be that literal. It just helps helps you to kind of give you an idea of what it can look like, but it doesn't, if you're making it too literal, then like that's just gonna be too, too much. Um, so just have this and use this as like a guide and a, a placement along lines. Uh, this one is my favorite one. It is the golden triangle. So this is the rule that states that the subjects should be composed in the images of a triangle. So you could see here that these are all the triangles here, 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 here. And we are going to, um, you can see that here, everything is hits the lines here, like right here, right here, right here. And it just helps with that composition. We have some more examples. It's a little bit hard to see. Um, but this is the golden um, triangle where you can see that it, it hits literally on the line right here, which is one of my favorite photos. And then we have here, this it line, the line hits it right here and hits the strawberry right here. So we're, we're mapping this out just to be able to hit these points so that it makes it look really, really visually pleasing. And this one is really hard to see, but it hits the line right here and then literally follows all of these lines back up and the other other point of intersection is right here. So you could see how it's like literally composed. And I'm telling you in the beginning, you're gonna be like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. This is so confusing. I have to put this line here and this line here. But as you continue and you, you're you growing and you're continuously practicing, this will become second nature. 
I did not group this photo based on this grade. It just happened to be that when I put it into Lightroom and I saw this, I was like, oh my God, that's insane. So it's just, it, I started from zero and so can you. So I'm telling you, it will become second nature. You just have to keep practicing. Okay, so we have your phi grid here. It's different from the rule of thirds because this is the golden ratio. So it's not equal parts. Remember in the rule of thirds, we had all those equal parts. This is not equal parts. So here's just some examples of what it would look like if you use the phi grid. Again, you can go into Lightroom and in the crop tool and develop module. In the crop tool, you can go in here and see this phi grid in action and see how you can crop your photo to fit it or see how it fits in with your photos. Okay, and then this is a three one, super hard to see because I just snapshotted these from Lightroom and Lightroom doesn't have a dark enough grid, but this is what the grid looks like over your photos. So you could see that this is the little spiral here um, and this is the golden ratio, um, the Fibonacci spiral. So see how it's not literal, but it still makes sense. And then you have your rule of thirds. We have um, intersecting line here and here. You don't have to hit them all. It's not like you're trying to like hit every single line. It's not, you don't have to do that. It's just paying attention to the things that are hitting those lines and seeing how it makes sense. Like see how everything here lines up with this line over here. And then we have the golden triangle, which is super hard to see, but it hits it right here. And it goes this line all the way here and hits again here and through the, um, and through the pie. So one picture can have multiple compositional techniques. There is no right or wrong. It's really just showing you that it works and that's it. Okay, some other visually pleasing techniques. We have patterns, repetition, mimicking the food with the same shape and props and using different shapes. So let's see what that means. So patterns, repetition, and shapes. So when you look at a photo and you're just like, oh my God, that's so pleasing because like the symmetry of it, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a symmetry person. If I see something that's like symmetrical, I'm like, oh, I need that. Or, oh, I really like that. So. Um, having symmetry and repetition and different kind of patterns in your photos are going to really help them stand out. Um, this was some crazy looking thing I found on Pinterest and I was like, I need to try that. <laughs> so there it was. And you can see, we'll, we'll, we'll get into balance in a second, but you can see that the rest of the image is, there's literally nothing around it. It's not heavily styled because this image, this part of the, of the center is so in your face that if I had more stuff around, it would take away from that center part. Um, so you wanna think about the balance in your photo too. Um, so a repetition of repeated shapes between the food and your props is gonna really create that balanced look in your photo. So in this one, I have a lot of circles, a lot of mimicking. So this loaf um, cake is the same shape as the, as the parchment paper, but then I have a lot of circles and different circles. So I have, you know, this circle without the orange, this circle with orange, and then this with all these different circles and colors and all these things. And here you can see that I have all these different shapes of all these different circles and just like everything that I'm using is a circle. And that's gonna help reinforce this um, visually pleasing um, image. Okay, using props to mimic your food. So you can see how the basket here is kind of like the same shape as the egg. And I pointed it on a diagonal to mimic the placement. And then this is the same um, thing that we talked about before, the roundness of the cake, the round parts are placed on the round areas of the, the border of the plate. So really thinking about the shapes of the food to mimic your, the shapes of the um, props and whatever else you're using to mimic the shapes of the food to just add that extra layer. Okay, this is, I don't know what this is called because I kind of made it up, but um, the same but different technique. So I like to use the same shape with um, same shape, but kind of different. So you can see here that I'm using the same shape because they're all kind of round plates, but they're different. So some have different textures, some have different, you know, they add different levels of, of interest to the image. This can be, you know, there's like scallop here, but like a different kind of scallop here and they're all round and they all have like, they're all kind of gray. So they're all kind of the same, but they're different. <laughs> and so this for me just really creates a really interesting dynamic photo. Um, and you could use this for food and not just for props and things like that. So using something that is the same, but a little bit different all over and in a pattern is gonna help bring out that excitement in a photo. Okay, balance. So creating balance is really essential to your photos because you don't wanna overwhelm the viewer or confuse them as to what the main subject of your photo is saying. So you have to make sure that you have a lot of balance. So you can do this by framing your subject, elevation 
and balancing out your colors, your space, and your patterns. So first we're gonna talk about framing your subject. So this is different than working inside the frame because you want to manipulate the viewer's eyes around the subject. So what you're gonna do is place something in the middle and then place something in all four corners so that your eye, your eye is being like forced into the center. So you could do something like that. Um, you can use elevation points. So this is like different heights. So important. firstly, this is really important for straight on shots because obviously with, you know, overhead shots, it's gonna be a little bit different, but it can still work. So we have this first one here, one, two, three, four, five. So we're not just looking at something that has the same height, we're going up in the height so that it creates this like visual balance and this visual excitement because there's different layers to it. And you can see the same thing kind of here where we have this, um, you know, this ice cube and then there's the cup and then we have these things in the, in the, the leaves and then we have the, the tray. So there's just like a lot happening here. You have to pay attention though to your, um, your aperture and things like that when you're shooting, when you're doing an overhead shot like this, because things are gonna be out of focus and just have to make sure that you have the right thing in focus that you want to be in focus. Okay, then we can balance out your colors. So using a set of colors in a pattern. So we have white, brown, white, brown, white, and then this tan color of my skin because your skin color is still a color. So paying attention and balancing out those colors are gonna be helpful to create that symmetrical balanced look. You could do the same thing here. It's also white and brown, shockingly. Um, white, brown, white, brown. So thinking about how you can balance out your colors can really be helpful when you're creating this like symmetrical balanced out photo. Um, you can use a set of colors and patterns, the same thing as before, pink, white, and this like golden hue. So you can see how I really broke up because if I put this loaf on this um, wooden tray, then it would not be, it wouldn't be as, you know, in your face. But because I broke up the colors, it helps to add the extra layer of dimension. Um, okay, so really to make the food stand out, you can try using the same color background and pop and props, and that really helps that to like bring out your photo. Um, you can see the colors get really like saturated in that. Um, and then you can balance out your patterns of the space. So just like I said before with the apples, with that Pinterest thing that I found, because the inside is so detailed, the outside is so minimal because you don't want to take away from the intricacy of the part of the dish that you want the viewer to see. So I'm not going to create this like, you know, crazy elaborate scene around this area right now, because right now I just want you to focus on that. So um, speaking more about balancing space, um, you can see here, you know, we talked about negative space, but just again, this is your super busy area and this is your super not so busy area. So this is negative space and this is your positive space. And so just making sure your space is balanced well um, and it doesn't seem too um, heavy on either side, just making sure that you have that kind of balance. Okay, so we also talk about visual weight when we're talking about balance. So what that means is when you have something in the photo that is just taking up too much area in the photo and it's kind of taking away from what the photo is really meant to be. So for example, on the left, this prop takes away from the main focus of the photo because of the size and the color, because the size is kind of the same size as these Max over here. It kind of just like takes away, like you don't even look at these, you go straight to the pink frosting. And because it's pink and everything else is white, that's where your eye is going. And in this photo, the spoon handle is just, looks too big and the cup just like looks too big for the whole area. So thinking about the different things, also like your props, like is your hand gonna be too big? Is the cup gonna be too big? Paying attention to like the different sizes that are in your photo, because sometimes, especially if you're doing like a pour shot or, or you're holding something, you're holding a cup, but like your hand is like 10 times bigger than the cup, like that's not gonna look good. So we're gonna have to just think about um, the different sizes um, and different props, especially when your hands are involved. Okay, so we're gonna put it all together with multiple techniques and we're gonna use your imagination because like I said, once you know the rules, you can use your imagination and kind of break them or work around them. So the compositional rules will give you the head start, but it's really up to you and your creativity and your imagination to take it to the next level. So like this photo in the beginning, this is me using multiple compositional techniques. So here you can see the different colors that we're gonna show. This is the picture without it. Then we have leading lines from 
over here in the black arrows. You can see all these leading lines happening here. You even have leading lines from these little stems of the pairs. We have the rule of odds in the uh, blue circles, and we have using triangles in the purple. We have the rule of thirds, which hits right here. So we have like a bunch of things kind of happening. Um, we're also like balancing out the colors and all those kinds of things. Um, there's also a lot of other things at play here. There's color story, there's layering, there's texture, which is a lot of other things that we're not going into today. But um, just for the sake of just understanding the photo, there's just so much happening to make it put it together um, that, you know, just really make it bright and exciting and fun. And then we can have um, something like this where you have the same kind of situation. So we have a bunch of different things happening here. So we're using the rule of thirds, which hits like right over here which is this point like right here where the two backdrops meet. We have our leading lines here, our elevation points. So like we have, we're starting here, one, two, three, four, five. And then these are also leading lines. So your, your eyes are going up. We also have lines of the direction of the chocolate. Like I'm not just gonna like place the chocolate down. Like I am made sure to make sure that the diagonals were pointing in a certain way. We also have curves. So you can see here, we have a curve between where all the props are being placed. We have mimicking shapes. So I mimic the shape of the cake with this round cake board or whatever it's called plate. So we have one, two, three, we have a lot of round things happening. We have the plates, we have the cake, we have the cake board, we have the cups. So there's just like a lot of things happening in this one photo. Um, so like I said before, putting together a bunch of things we'll be able to, you'll be able to have an even more exciting photo, but like make sure that they make sense. Like I wouldn't just like shove a bunch of stuff into the frame just cause you're like, oh, this is a technique and this is a technique. Like you don't wanna do that. You wanna make sure that it makes sense so that it elevates the photo. So the same rules of composition, light and color apply for macro shots and wider shots. So I know we talked about a lot of like all the examples were more wider shots, but we have kind of the same things here. And that pistachio shot that I was talking about in the beginning, um, is right here on the left. So this was like, literally, I was gonna throw them out, something really ordinary, something not exciting. And I noticed that they had these like little inside colors of pink. And pink is one of my colors in my branding. And I was like, okay, well, I have a pink backdrop. That would be really cool. I also really love the way that this pink and orangey color looks together. And so I just like threw these on a board. I tried it to create some kind of like little curvy things, putting them in certain, um, you know, spots and stuff like that. And I took the shot and I was like, you know what, this is pretty cool. I really like it. So it's turning something that's ordinary into something that is extraordinary. And then over here, this is the plum tart from before. Um, and you can see all the leading lines. So I didn't just like plop these guys down there. I made, I made sure to make it make sense. So like this, this line is going this way, this one's going this way, this one's going this way, this one's going that way. I mean, we could do this all day. So making sure that, you know, you have the understanding of composition and that it can pertain to really anything. It can go to macro or a wide angle shot. Okay, so your homework. Um, we have a composition checklist for you. Um, you can just enter your, your information. Um, Yana, I'm sure you're taking care of that or someone is taking care of that. You could get the links there. Um, there is also a grid on your camera. So in your camera settings, you can set up a grid while you're shooting. They have like the rule of thirds and, and a diagonal. They don't have all like the Fibonacci spiral and things like that, but they have grids on there that will kind of help you. Or if you're tethering, there's grids on Lightroom and things like that because that can help you. Um, and so in terms of your homework, just to practice composition, um, you can create a photo with a more basic technique like the rule of odds, thirds, negative space, working with triangles and curves, and then create a photo using one of the goals and ratio rules and then create a photo with multiple compositional techniques, but make sure that they make sense because if they don't make sense, it's not gonna have the effect that you want. Okay, so just so that you guys all know, I, uh, if you want to work together, I run a website called stylemecreatively.com, which is where I house all of my food photography things. So there's a ton of freebies in there. Um, I have a beginner course that's coming out in August really, really soon. It's for, if you don't understand yet how to use your manual mode on your camera, this is a course for you. It's gonna teach you all about how to use your, your camera and all the things around there, just like really, really like beginner stuff. And then my signature program is the Style Mastermind, which is a 90 day 
food photography mentorship program that really helps you find your style and make money with your business. And the only way to come into the mastermind is through an application process, we get on a call, you have to use, you have to know how to use your camera in manual mode, which is why I have the beginner course coming out soon. So I only work with food photographers, stylists, and bloggers who already know how to use their DSLR on manual mode, because those are my students that do the best. And I don't want you coming into a program where you don't know how you're going to get the most out of it. So this is a prerequisite. You have to know how to do it. Otherwise you can't get into the program. Um, yeah. And once you do what happens in here, is we have a 90 day program, it's three months. We get to know each other real well. <laughs> we talk every day on Slack. We have weekly group coaching calls and these are the modules inside the program. So what happens is we have a membership site where you'll get these um, modules on mindset, creativity, branding, signature style, color and light, composition, which is a lot of what we just talked about, but we have even more advanced techniques in there, storytelling, troubleshooting and making money, which is what everyone wants to know about. So what this program looks like is it's eight weeks of all those modules. We have one-time weekly group calls for 12 weeks. We talk every day on Slack for 12 weeks. And plus we have styling videos, PDF templates, and we get into the real nitty gritty of, you know, growing your business, supporting your business, how much you should, how much you can charge, how to find those clients. Um, and yeah, and at, we are starting in December. Applications open in November for the mastermind. And what happens is, you book a call, we hop on a call, we talk about whether or not the program is right for you or if I'm the right fit for you or if you're the right fit for the mastermind. And if not, then no harm done because I only want to accept people in and I only want to coach people who I know will have crazy success. And this is just some of the testimonials that you could see here, um, or you could see some more testimonials on my site. Um, so yeah, we've had like 65 students so far. It's been really, really fun um, and really awesome. So. Just wanted to say thank you for having me, B&H. This has been awesome. Um, I'm just so honored to be here. I really appreciate you guys. And this has just been so, so, so much fun. So I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, Yana, I'm going to stop my share right now and see if anybody has questions or anything. Uh, that was amazing. Oh my I, gosh, I was like looking at the time. I'm like, how are we on time? How are we on no, time? Perfect. Oh, I, I took notes the same, but different. Oh yes. my God. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know why I made it up. It's fine, but it works. <laughs> no, it's new to me. And I'm, it's what makes me so excited about your course. And I highly recommend anyone watching this to get on that wait list because I have followed Sam for so long and she is the course to take. Aww, so, thank you, Anna. Of course. I do have questions for you. Yes, I'm here. I'm available. <laughs> So let's see, let's start with, I love this one from Leah, how to even focus and choose the right composition before you start shooting. So many to choose from can cause overwhelming and confusion sometimes. Like, shoot. yeah, that makes totally sense. get that. Okay. So I would say, I would think about number one, create a shot list. So I know it's confusing. So I would say, write down all the shots that you want to take and then organize it based off of that. So ask yourself, you can also ask yourself, like, what's the wow factor here? Like, what is it about this shot that has this like wow factor that I'm trying to portray and start there? Because a lot of times we'll get into a shoot and you'll be like, oh my God, I want to take this photo. And then it doesn't work. And so you have to troubleshoot around that. And that's okay. Like that's part of the process. Like it's part of troubleshooting. It's part of like photography. And sometimes more often than not, you will end up having a better photo than the one that you thought you were gonna take. So I would say start with a shot list and decide what photos you want. Start from there and go down the list until you're done, but start with the wow factor. So like the most exciting part of it, start with that one and then go down your shot list. I love the shot list idea. That's so important to any shoot. Like you think it wouldn't yeah. be, but you have, it's very important to even like food photography because you have it in other, you know, industries and film and photo and it's imperative here as well. Yes, yes. Right. Next one, Elvin Mann says, how does one start their career in food photography? That's a loaded question. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, how do you start? Okay, you, it's really, you I would say, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's not like one question. It's not like a simple answer. It, it also depends on like your goals, your, like what you want. Um, do you want to shoot for brands? Do you want to shoot freelance? Do you want to like, there's just so many different aspects to it. Um, I would say start your business, make sure that you're practicing, um, getting to practice all the time. Even if you don't have clients, create because you're going to show basically clients what you can do by showing your work. And secondly, even if you don't feel like you're ready to reach out to brands or clients, you need to start doing it now. So many of my clients who like literally asked me to do something. And I was like, Oh, I have no idea how to do that. I'm like, yeah, sure. I could do that. Like literally do it. Even though you're scared out of your mind, just do it. So start reaching out to brands, start find somebody who kind of embodies and does what they do and see what they did to get to where they want and follow those, follow that path. I love that. That's basically what I um that sounded so stuck <laughs> no, I love it <laughs> well let's see this one says okay Lori from YouTube when you start a project to shoot a recipe do you plan ahead on which of these grids you'll focus on or do you first focus on the story you want to tell and then choose yeah I always focus on the story I want to tell what the wow factor is what parts of it that I want to be like hey this is the really cool part and then I work around it I might think about um like leading lines especially if I see a lot of lines like that cookie shot if there are a lot of lines like I'll be like okay this makes sense for this but I technically first will will think about the story the mood all those type of type color I actually always always for me personally I always think color first it's just that's just how I work I just do color first um and then the compositional techniques come in after Okay, final one. Do you work with a food stylist? Um, I don't. I'm a jack of all trades. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> oh my it's gosh. I have a question myself. Yeah. I had to ask, of course. What is your favorite bake to shoot? Because I know I hate like making, I hate shooting like banana bread because it's just like that one thing you have to yeah. cook. But what um, is your favorite? I really like to shoot cakes. I like to shoot cookies, even though cookies and I didn't get along for a very long time. We didn't get along. Um, and instead of being like, I hate shooting cookies, I like went towards it. So if there's something that you don't like to shoot, I would say, don't be like, oh, I hate shooting that. No, no, no. Go do it and master it so that you don't feel like you hate it anymore. Um, and I really like shooting produce. I think it's just it's just pretty. Like I like a lot of produce and like a lot of things and yeah, like process shots of that. I love yeah. That. Yeah. Cookies, I feel like they're just legendary for like being so difficult. Cause they are very, cause essentially they're just mini multiples. <laughs> and that's very hard. It's hard. It is hard. And it's always so impressive when someone gets it and then you're like, ah, oh, how did they do yeah, that? Yeah. It's hard. Very. But yeah. All right. That's a wrap for us. Yay. Um, I'm going to close us out. I'm going to mention again, go look at the links on the chat for her waitlist, for her resources, because she's she has gear resources on her site. She has the waitlist for her beginner's course, and she has so much to offer you guys. And I you know, couldn't be happier that we did this today. Yeah, so, me too. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, my God. Should we do another one? OK. Mar Mar Mario says, I saw most of your photos are vertical. Are the rules still valid for horizontal frames? Yes. Take the rule, guys. Yeah, the rules are still, the, they are the same for horizontal. The reason why food photography is usually shot in vertical is because in any medium that you're sharing it, whether it's on Instagram, you, uh, not YouTube, but well, that's video, but like, you know, like Pinterest and editorial, it's all usually shot um, vertically because you just can fit more in the frame. Um, sometimes you will have clients who will be like, I need this shot horizontally. And then it's the same techniques. Um, but 95% of the time I'm shooting vertically. That's it. Oh, oh no, I have, they're popping in. Okay. Leah asks one more last one. Can you please explain what mood means? What mood? So, okay. Let's say you, yeah, let's say you want to shoot a summary, um, a summary cocktail. You're not going to put up like a black backdrop and like dark props and all those things because it's not going to, the message, something's going to get lost in translation there. You're not going to really understand that like, oh, you know, like 
a summery cocktail doesn't really fit in the mood of like a black, all this stuff. Like if you're shooting a summery cocktail, it's going to be light and bright and fun colors and all those things because the mood is summer. And so you want to portray that as summer. You don't want to portray it as like grim and like, you know, all that scary stuff. So that's why the mood is important to share your story. It's a great explanation. Like even I got that. That's fabulous. All right. That's all the time we have. Sam, thank you so much for thank being you. here. Really thank appreciate you. This is so awesome. I'll talk to you soon. So appreciate you. Yes. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. All right, guys, we're going to transition into our next session. And let's get that started with our screen. Brent, if you can put it up. Okay. I'm giving a second. Okay, I'm just gonna start and we're gonna open this. So hello and welcome everyone again to Food Photography Week here at BNH. And this is our first day of it. We are running sessions from July 19th through the 22nd for Food Week. And my name is Jana and I am with the amazing creative marketing team here at BNH. I am so excited to kickstart this week today. It means, again, so much to me personally because I have my own food blog and, and gram. And as you all may suspect, it is absolutely delicious to work in this field. So starting today, again, we will be hosting four days of wonderfully talented food photographers. We just had Sam on and that was such an amazing course. I, I learned so much from it. We have Jenna up next talking to how to even create a live, like she's doing a live demo for a process of a food shoot. And I'm so excited for that. So they're gonna, every one of these panelists, they're gonna talk to their craft and they're gonna provide educational tools to help you kickstart or elevate your food photography work yourself. And again, these are just like amazingly talented people who I'd listen to speak all day, every day. Um, so let's get the schedule up if we can. I will pull it up. I'll just talk to it. Let's see. I'll just wait a really quick second. But basically today we had Sam talk to Technique and Composition and you can check out her work with us in the replay on YouTube. Right now we're gonna do Jenna's The Secret to Standing Out as a Food Photographer and the live demo. Tomorrow we have Maria talking to how she's actually created a cookbook during the pandemic. And I'm jealous, that's awesome. And then Alan Shapiro finding Zen and Delight with food photography. On Wednesday, we have Jessica, so simple yet appealing. Steve Geralt is gonna take us through the perfect pour shot, which is gonna be epic. And I'm, I can't wait to meet, see that one. And then Thursday, we're gonna close out with a food influencer panel with David Ma, Jessica Hirsch, Remy Muramato Park. It's gonna be so awesome to just listen to them talk about how Instagram and social media helps us, how, what the trends are and, you know, everything to do with that world because it is integral at this day and age to use these media tools. And finally, we're gonna do a food critique, an image photo critique, which you are all welcome to participate in. I'm going to host it with my colleague, Michael Hollander, and that will segue us into me talking about our sweepstakes. So you are, all of you are more than welcome to come in and post on either Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag BNH, BH Food Photo Week. And you can post your photos to it and you get a chance to win a Fujifilm XS10 camera with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. That's, I want to participate. And you get also, what else do you get? You get a Transcend memory card as well. One of these photos, some of these photos are going to be chosen for the food critique. And if you get chosen, tune in. We'll, you know, do the whole critique and it will be here on YouTube at 2 p.m. on Thursday. 
So let's jump right in. Let's jump in with Jenna. Jenna, can you see me? Hi, yes. Hey, how's it going, Jenna? Amazing. I'm going to intro you. Jenna's amazing. She offers such beautiful mentorship programs to kickstart your food photography career. If you haven't seen her website, please check it out. I'm like, I'm so impressed with her setup. I am fangirling over here. I'm going to let you take off and, you know, talk about you. And yeah, Jenna, take it away. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the introduction and for the kind words. And thank you, BH, for having me part of Food Photography Week. I'm very excited to be speaking today. Um, so, if you don't know me yet, I'm Jenna Carlin, commercial food and lifestyle photographer. And today we're going to be going over a presentation that I have all about finding your artistic voice. And then we're going to jump into a live demo with some food styling and food photography. For you. So I am going to just get started right away with the presentation. Okay, so today we're going to speak about how to find your artistic voice in photography. Again, I'm Jenna Carlin, commercial food and lifestyle photographer obsessed with helping other photographers reach their creative and financial goals. I have been a photographer for over 10 years, mainly in the food photography realm working for clients such as Ghirardelli, Kohl's, Sam's Club, Martha Stewart, and many more. So you're here because you love food photography and want to learn more about it. So let's just briefly touch on why food photography is such an important and such a valuable sought after skill. Food blogs elevate recipes. They attract and appeal to the readers. It helps the blog stand out as well as showcase their brand. And for commercial photography, it appeals to the consumer's emotions and makes them stop, look, and buy. I hope you can see the value on what you are bringing to both types of companies. Okay, so now let's talk about you. I want you to think about where you are in your journey. Do you currently align with beginner, hobbyist, or have a few paying clients, or are you an established professional? No matter where you are, on this timeline, you are right, you are in the right place and there is something here for everyone. So are you unsure of your voice or style? All the photography techniques and business strategies in the world won't help you if your work is not unique and your message is unclear. So what is an artistic voice and how can you develop your own unique style? It's your visual signature an extension of who you are. It is your one of a kind photography style so distinct that people can recognize your work from miles away. I want you to think about a photographer you admire. How do you know it's their work? What makes their style so unique? Is it the combination of their lens choice, depth of field? Are they a minimalist? Do they excel on bringing out the texture of their subject? How would you describe their food photography? For example, is it bright, cheerful, dark, mysterious? What really captivates you about their unique style? Is it the way they tell a story or the way that you see their values shine through in every photo? What can you infer about their personality from their photography? To take this massive steps further, it would be a good idea to find out who they admire and study their work as well to broaden your network of influence and dig deep. Now think about what you want people to know about your work. Why develop a unique photography style? Here's three advantages of having a distinct visual signature and how it can have a tremendous impact on your business, both financially and emotionally. Number one, it helps you stand out from the crowd and become more memorable. In a globalized market, having a unique photography style makes you distinctive in the minds of the public and potential clients. Clients usually already have a clear idea of the photography treatment they're after for a project. They want to work with photographers who can produce something that closely conveys a certain aesthetic and an end result. The same goes for your blog. Brands want influencers that align with their aesthetic and values already. That's the beautiful thing about when you figure out your style, starting from within. 
When your style comes from your core values, your character traits and ethics, your work will speak for itself and the heart of <clears throat> and the heart you put into your photography becomes much more than just technical aspects of what makes you an amazing photographer. When you're creating that work, your personal and career goals align and there are few things more rewarding than that. And that is what we are aiming for today. Two, your unique selling point. Having a recognizable style helps you close deals. This will also help you carve out a niche within the market. A huge misconception I see time and time again is being a jack of all trades and using that as a selling point. In reality, being a jack of all trades means being easily unforgettable. While it's amazing to have all of those skills in your back pocket, it is not how you sell to your potential clients. Also, I heard this quote and I don't know who said it, but it goes something like, when you do everything, it's the fast track to beige. This phrase sticks with me and I think a lot about it. And I even believe when you do everything, it is the slow track to beige because you're spending all this time creating so many different styles of work in every direction. What I'd love to see is for you to find your voice from within and start creating work based on that. And when your content and your message and your values all align and your skills get better, all while you're working on your core values, think about what that does for your life. Like how purposeful do you feel right now working with brands that actually align with your principles? Three, becoming an authority. Having a distinct voice in food photography also helps you become an artist in your own right and you'll become an authority in your field. I do want to mention that there is a fine line. Having a certain style and voice is fantastic. It's the dream. However, if you shoot everything the exact same, it becomes a little boring. And if you think it's boring, so will your clients. So keep thinking about your, your aesthetic, how it can expand and how you can expand on it in a way to reinvent yourself, but keeping the same core values and finding different nuances to create your work. So how exactly do you find your visual voice in photography? Let's start with your brand. So let's talk about your physical brand. This is something you are already very familiar with. When you think about your brand, it's your logo, it's your marketing, it's your colors, it's your website. But have you ever thought about your emotional brand? What makes you unique as a person? So I'd love for you to make this web graph, start with your emotional brand and then make branches off of it and tell me what your personal attributes are, your core values, character traits, and your core ethics. Start writing down words that all describe you and just keep going in this brainstorm map. And then think if you could describe your character which three words you would use. For example, introverted, curious, analytic. Now, if you're struggling to think about words that describe you, you can easily reach out to your family and friends and ask them. So don't be afraid, and I'm sure they would love to help you. Just ask them, what do you think makes me unique as a person? When you have trouble, why do you come to me? Or what do you think my core values are after knowing me for so long? I think they can help you come up with some really strong words and help you think about this in a whole new light. Another easy thing to think about is your fashion style. You're making these decisions every day already. So how would you describe your fashion style? Is it chic, casual, elegant, sophisticated? Your photography should reflect what makes you uniquely you. It's totally okay to look outside of food photography. So how to do it. Step one, collect imagery. Start by creating an imagery scrapbook. Collect anything that interests you artistically, personally, and aesthetically. Now, I'd love to do this exercise with the photographers I mentor. It's one of the first exercises we do in our 12 month long program. I have them collect images, um, very quickly from the gut, 
bringing a bunch of visual, beautiful Im images together in one place and you grab whatever strikes a chord and you don't have to think about it too long. Take 20 to 40 minutes really making a mood board just for you. And these can be food photography images, still lives, paintings by other artists, um, landscapes, interiors, and even graphic designs. They can be anything that is a visual representation about what you like. And you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about what it is about that image right then and there, because later, once you stand back and look at it as a whole, you're gonna see some common threads. Is there anything conceptual that pulls you in and interests you? What are the visual characteristics that attract you? Look at your collection. What is the overall connection? Is it composition? Is it lighting? Is it texture? Is it the relationship with the subject? What is it that speaks to you? Step two, what moves you? Food photography that stands out is so much more than just good looking food. How will you capture what draws you in through your lens? Sharpen your technique. Master the three pillars of good food photography. Photography technique, art direction and prop styling, and breathtaking food. Practice, practice, practice. Taking photos daily not only improves your technique, it also hones your intuition. I want you to think about that because we all know that Practice makes perfect and you just want to become faster at what you're doing, but really think about how those skills, once you learn them, they don't just move things faster. It strengthens your confidence to work with clients, to work with other food stylists, and to reach out and network with people. So your intuition about food photography really becomes defined and beautiful. So sharpen your technique, you, I'm sorry, sharpen your unique perspective. Each photographer sees the same scene differently. Learn the rules and then break them. A delicate balance between being rebellious and studious. How can I shoot this in another way? Explore new possibilities by asking yourself, how can I do this in another way? Discover new connections in your daily food photography practice. Don't be afraid to try diverse styles and techniques. Perfection is not important, but focusing on who you are is. Authenticity comes from being true to who you are as an artist. I really do think this is a beautiful and power, this is beautiful and powerful because we all start to work on perfecting our skill sets behind the image. That's something we all work on and strive for all the time. But working on perfecting the authenticity can be more powerful. I actually just read a quote from Ansel Adams that said something on the line, along the lines of, there's nothing worse than a sharp image with a fuzzy concept. Having a clear concept, knowing what you bring to the table and how you convey it to the world is incredibly important in your food photography journey. This has a huge impact too on your creativity and what you can earn as a food photographer. Step three, look within yourself. Food photographers with a fresh, strong and distinct style often found a way to portray their personality in their work as an extension of their personality and character. So let's practice. Use three adjectives to describe this artist based on the image. For example, bold, mysterious, serious. You can go ahead and write those down. Another one, here's another one, three adjectives to describe this one. For example, vibrant, elegant, and whimsical. What else can you think to describe this person who photographed this image? The bottom line is, what interests you personally will reflect in your photography. Step four, look beyond. Which food photographers do you admire and why? Remember to also look beyond yourself and food photographers for inspiration to spark creativity. Step five, analyze and condense. So keep a creative workbook. Pinterest uh, it can be a print, I'm sorry. It can be a print, Pinterest mood board, some magazines, folders on a computer, a scrapbook, 
I do all of these. <laughs> uh, let's see, how to analyze your inspiration. Study your creative workbook frequently. What makes the photography intriguing? Make a list of all the adjectives you use to describe it. Edit your list down to three to five strong adjectives. Unique voice. Your images consistently communicate the same emotions or the same vibe. In conclusion, experiment with styles, techniques, and subject matters. Practice, practice, practice. Channel your personality, fuse different elements, and you'll get a photography style all your own. So just to recap, you've learned why it's important to develop a truly unique photography style. What is a visual voice or visual signature and what it really is and how you can develop your unique voice over time. You saw how your food photography can transform through consistent practice and doing the work. Finding your voice is part of the journey to becoming a photographer in your own right. And it's absolutely worth the effort. So why is it so important to find your unique voice? You can easily turn your food photography passion into a successful business. So what happens when you take the time to do this work? Listen to your intuition and really hone in on your unique photography voice. Your brand and style are crystal clear. You are now so much more engaged in your work because you're not trying to replicate others' success. You're, learning, you're leaning into your own zone of genius. So your work is higher quality, consistent, and you're more excited to create. You spend less time comparing yourself to others and more time focusing on what matters creating and connecting with brands and clients. It truly brings energy and vitality back into your work and is beyond liberating. You will not, you're not fighting your creative instinct anymore. You're unleashing it. And most importantly, it will have an impact on your business itself financially. You're no longer positioning yourself like any other photographer. Your work is truly unique. You can now command a higher day rate and creative fees. This creates even more freedom in your business when you're not taking any low paying job that comes along. You're free to work with brands that excite you and have a proper budget. You are free to take more time to create work that ignites your soul and attract those brands. Naturally, as you create more work that is true to yourself and is uniquely you, you're gonna to wanna to share that with the world. So you'll need to learn how to convey your voice to brands, position, position yourself as a professional. And if you want to command those higher wages we talked about, you'll need to learn how to price like a pro. Which brings me to Portfolio to Profit. It is my signature mentorship program. I invite you to join me for an exclusive free training you'll see when you apply that will show you how to create a successful, profitable food photography business and start booking forward figure days. But there's one more thing you need. When you hone into your photo photographic voice, not only will you have clarity and more profitability, there are intangible benefits beyond creating work that excites you, confidence and courage. If I had to name the single most important must have for food photographers, it's courage. Not a top tier camera, thousand dollar lens, a degree from art school or a high profile internship. It's courage. Courage to pick up the camera, courage to see food in a whole new way, courage to learn composition and lighting, courage to share your work publicly, not knowing what the response will be, courage to approach brands and other photographers to network, courage to create a food photography portfolio and put it out there in the world, Courage to confidently discuss pricing with clients and not back down. Courage to hold your boundaries and, <clears throat> and charge extra for scope creep. Courage to turn down brands that don't align with you. Courage to try and be willing to fail. 
Every single positive thing in my food photography journey started with courage to pick up a camera, to put myself out there, to get the nose, to feel unsure and nervous, to market my skill. Fortune favors the bold, nothing ventured, nothing gained. You've heard them all before. So are you ready for a chance to show your courage in food photography and take the next step? I invite you to apply to Portfolio to Profit and get the bonus free training that teaches my exact framework on how I use to build a six figure food photography business despite recessions, pandemics, and being a busy mom and wife. If this is something that you want for yourself, I invite you to apply today. So there are few greater feelings than when you can align your life and financial goals. You've made the steps to find your passion in food photography. Now let's narrow that down even further to set your work apart and find brands that are looking for your artistic voice. All right, thank you so much. I really hope you enjoyed that presentation. We are gonna switch gears and go into the live demo. We are so excited to share that with you. Um, it is going to be in a flat lay, but we're gonna be using a macro lens so that we're really creating a really strong depth of field and um, a really tight composition. So it's gonna be really exciting. Um, I've already started it for you guys, so it's not starting completely from scratch, but I'll catch you up on what we all have done so far. And um, let's see. So just to start, I wanna describe the recipe to you. So it is a tropical summer fruit bowl. And um, I usually work with food stylists. So uh, this was something that my assistant and I could easily whip up together, just chopping up fruit, a simple recipe, um, but it's really gonna uh, have an impact because of the color and composition and everything else we have in store for you today. So let me turn my camera on and we can get this rolling. Okay. So we are going to start by describing the lights. Oh, first, I do want to mention that if you have any questions at all during this session, uh, feel free to put, pop them in the chat. And um, yeah, we'll just get right, we'll get right to it. I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, so we are using pro photo lights. I have, back up here. so it's kind of hard to see, but we have one down here. Let me reach. Hold on. Okay, we have one down here that is a bare bulb and that's gonna be our hard light, kind of um, really creating some texture and highlights on the subject matter down here. And this one here um, is another pro photo. These are the pro photo um, B1X, they're travel lights, but they're really great because they don't have any cords and have a really great battery power. So this is, I have two pro photo lights being used here today. One bare bulb, like I mentioned, and this one is on like a three foot beauty dish softbox um, with a double diffusion on the inside. It's really, really great to work with. Um, so that's kind of creating our overall soft light that we're gonna see. And then the hard light coming through. This here is a, um, a Matthews flag, it is, it looks to be about five feet by one and a half feet long. And um, just is a black card, basically carding off a lot of my softbox so that we are gonna get a really nice moody shot. Um, when I first started um, thinking about this shoot, uh, I started with looking at my own portfolio, what's missing, what do I wanna create? What have I been wanting to create? And that kind of led into where this started was actually with the surface itself and thinking about um, that I have a lot of monochromatic work in, in my portfolio and I love it so much. But again, how can I, you know, take what I, you know, I feel like I love to do and I do really well and just kind of switch gears. What can I do to kind of expand what I'm already doing? 
So we are using um, a really colorful background and we are gonna be using an analogous color scheme. So we are using, we are using um, purple, blue, green, and yellow. Um, so knowing that I wanted to create something really colorful, I started with a really bright and colorful backdrop. So the first thing we started with was the surface. And then I ended up going into the prop room and looking around to see what I had that, um, that kind of felt, made me feel inspired. And I knew I already had seen some tropical fruit at the grocery store. That's really beautiful. So thinking about that, as I walked into the prop room, grabbed a broken plate, <laughs> but I knew I was going to be so cropped in that, um, that you're not going to be able to see it. So it'll be a surprise once you get to the actual shot. But we do have, um, so we started with that color scheme. I mostly grabbed all teal and blue props. And then from there, lay down a bunch of stuff and then knew I had a blueberry plant. So I kind of laid that in and then just started like concepting the recipe based on colors of ingredients. And so that's how this recipe came to be. And Jen, I think we can go ahead and share our screen. Okay, so let me move this stuff out of the way for you. So here's where we're at with the um, overhead shot. And we have, you can see the blueberries in here. I have a lavender plant to bring in. Um, you can kind of see the bucket of my blueberry thing, but we're gonna cover that up. This is the plate that I was speaking about. So it's actually pretty, it's broken right along this line here. And then um, I started by bringing in, I started with the frame of the shot. So come, like thinking a lot about composition and what might be in there. Um, I brought in this blueberry plant and I knew I wanted a really shallow depth of field. So that could either mean that I'm focused more on the surface or I'm more focused in the foreground to create some depth. And you can see here that I'm at aperture 2.8. So very shallow depth of field and um, definitely have a lot of color going on, but still get a very good sense of the moody style that I like to create in and um, a strong sense of color. So um, back to the focus, I brought this blueberry plant in and I really wanted these to be in focus. So what I did was then start building layers up towards the camera so that I could get my dish in focus. So you can see, if I zoom in, this is gonna land pretty close to where I need it to be once I fill this up with the fruit salad and then that beautiful shallow of the field. And then we've got the blueberries and parts of that are in focus, but again, we're on such a shallow of the field. It's not all of it, but it's a nice, nice portion. And what we have here in the fruit salad are these pepino melons that are super darling. And they got that beautiful purple and yellow color. So we're also gonna be using in the mix itself. Um, let me see if I can bring that up to, to the camera. Let's see. All right, so in the mix itself, uh, we have yellow kiwis, regular green kiwis, blueberries to go with the blueberry plant. Um, I already knew at home, I still had a nice variety of blackberries. So I brought that in too, because once you cut them in half, they have that purple color. So I'm looking forward to that. I didn't, we didn't add that in yet because I didn't want to um, color stain the whole thing. Let me see here, there we go. And then that melon is right here. It's a nice pale yellow. And we've got, I might throw some orchids in there, depending on how they look. Um, it's gonna have honey lavender for the drizzle on top. And I think that's it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start putting this in the set. Um, as you can see, there's lots of layering happening with the composition. There's um, elements that are just being cropped out. So giving the illusion that, uh, that there's more to the frame 
really helps with composition and makes it feel like an environment rather than uh, just a setup like you see here. Okay, just gonna go ahead and fill that up. So we did most of the cutting already, but we do have some things over here that I'm gonna be topping with. And again, if you have any questions at all, feel free to go ahead and ask them. Oh, we have a question. Great. So Sarah is asking, what lens are you using? Great question. Okay, so I have a Canon 5D Mark, uh, Mark IV camera here, and I have the Canon 100 millimeter macro. So this is a flat lay that, um, or overhead shot using a macro lens to create a lot of depth. So that was another thing that I really, that was really kind of a fun starting point for me was also besides knowing that I wanted to do a lot of color, I knew I wanted to do a nice tight shot with a lot of depth overhead. Great question. That was a great question. Lenses are so important in food. Um, I have another question for you. Great. It is from Leah and she is asking how, okay, can Jenna share how she is keeping her style fresh and ever evolving? How exactly do you do that? Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. So I kind of just briefly touched on it earlier, but um, I look and study my portfolio that I already have and I'm looking at it and thinking what, and I, and I do this with my students all the time all the time too. So um, it's a good practice to do for your own work. And, and I do it for myself is you go ahead and look at your, your body of work and see what you could be missing or what you could improve on or um, something that would still excite you. Cause I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not creating just anything. Right. So, but how, what are some key elements that still are like a part of my, um, Photographic voice would definitely be the heavy shadows, uh, the shallow depth of field, the how the composition is working. So those are elements that I know I need to keep. But what what am I willing to change up a bit? So definitely the color. Um, like I mentioned before, I do a lot of monochromatic work, and I just love it. And this is getting close to that. But by bringing in the pops of yellow and purple, I'm I'm now in the analogous color scheme. Definitely the recipes could be part of that too. I tend to really like when I get the chance to like photograph florals and berries and leaves, nature. I do a lot of agricultural photography as well. So that's, you know, that really helps tie into my style as well. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at that before I add the blackberries. So let's see, we might have to adjust the focus depending on what we see here. Oh, and our lights changed a little bit from when, let's see, one of them's not on. All right, so this is a fun trick to make sure that your lights are shooting. If you do this and look, do you, are you shooting? Mm -hmm. okay. If you do this and look at each light specifically when you're shooting it, it'll show you if it's going off. Yep. 
Okay, they're both firing. So I'm gonna check my settings to see if something changed in there. Or it could have just been that when I added all that fruit, it got rid of those beautiful green highlights and that could be the case. It is the case. So we are gonna um, make up for that by raising up my card. And then I'm bringing up my soft box, my soft light. All right. Good. So let's see. Um, I'm a little bit brighter on the top half. Oh, you know what? I'm going to add something there. Um, yeah, okay. So I have this lavender plant here. And so I'm just going to, I've already kind of secured this bucket and I'm just going to clamp this bucket to this bucket to get it where I want it to go. So using all sorts of styling, styling techniques here. And then um, I brought these to have handy, but they're just like, I'm just gonna use them to block light so they can have some shadows off frame, especially cause it got a little bright back there. All right, so that's a little wild. So I'm gonna do a little less. But I find that the way it frames the shot is kind of fun and it adds another layer of depth. So I'm just gonna tweak that a few times to get that in the right spot. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I like that green dish in the background. I was gonna put the honey back there, um, but now I'm thinking I'm going to empty the container on the right and fill that with honey instead. So I'm definitely not, um, you know, not afraid to like pivot or try out a few different things to just see what's working the best. I definitely like, like doing that and experimenting. Sorry, that is the honey bottle. All right, so we're gonna put that in. I'm also gonna put, I'm gonna grab one of these pieces of lavender that aren't precious in the actual shot. Oh, there's one. So to call out that it's a lavender honey, I'm gonna stick a piece of lavender in there. Hopefully in an area that's gonna be seen, we'll try it out. So on the surface, we're adding texture with these little key limes. I forgot to mention key lime juices in there too. Key limes. Um, and I'm gonna make a little room for my blackberries. Cause they're just too cute not to put in every recipe I make these days. And we'll add a couple of blackberries to the fruit salad. Hello, hello, I have a question. Hello, yeah. So Zarek is asking exactly how do you set up the light angles and how are they arranged? What is the yeah? Okay, great question. Um, so let me back up out of here without ruining anything. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, so the lights, um, I'm gonna go right in front of, so this is my, where I'm shooting, I'm like just facing my set here. So when I think about my set, I love to have the light come in from sort of a three quarter more behind kind of view to create. Uh, so the reason I like to do that personally is if um, it just feels natural and part of life. So like um, this, this image is, you know, when we're looking at it on screen, it's a vertical, it's up and down. And when you think about the sun, it's usually up, somewhere up around us. So that is relatively where I like to keep my light in perspective from the scene. So having it come from around this area, but typically never below, because it's just, it feels unnatural to me. Um, it's not really a rule or anything. It's just something that I kind of found works really well for me. And um, when I see things that are underlit, it's kind of like, even with people, it can feel alarming because like, if you think about someone at a campfire, that's like lighting up, like it's just not natural. <laughs> uh, so, um, so that's why I keep my lights in and around this sort of a rainbow area. And, um, and then for the type of way I like to shoot, um, my light stays pretty low to wherever I am. So with my scene being so low, um, and it's this low because of how high my tripod can go uh, overhead. So that's kind of why we're set up so low today. Um, but obviously the higher you go, the more your food stylist will appreciate it. You know, if it's at a normal table height, they really love that. And, um, and then that, and that would mean my lights would come up to, to really wherever perspectively it would be for for the situation. Now I started pretty low, but because I ended up not getting enough light right here, and I don't necessarily want to bring in a fill card to just fill it up, uh, I raise my light instead. So it brings more of a wraparound light to the food that's already there. I'm going to shoot another one because I added blackberries. And I just want to see how that's looking. Oh, look at that. Honey, that honey made it red. So that throws off my color scheme, but it looks awesome. Um, so that's just something I'm going to have to play around with later. I think what I'll end up doing is just subdue that a little bit to be a, a little bit more orange-ish, yellow, and figure out why. I mean, I'll probably look at that a little closer and see what it is um, that is making it so red. But we are going to switch up focus a little bit so that my blackberries are really sharp and then um and then we're really close so then we can end with q a um so definitely if you have any more questions go ahead and ask them let's take a look at that okay that's fun so um, I know we're getting close to time, but I what I'm going to do, because of our light, I'm going to kind of settle things down on the stuff that's to this side. I'm going to settle, settle it downward, and then on this side, build it up so it catches more light. Too. So you see that bottom half of that cup is very much in shadow. So we're going to build that up so it catches more light. So again, instead of adding a fill card, we can mani manipulate the light by adding or subtracting food or props or cards, anything. And then angling as much as you can things towards the light instead of away from it so it catches light.
All right, we'll take a look at that. All right, so now I just see that one little dark hole that I'm gonna fill. Um, but you guys can let me know, like, what do you think about the color scheme? What do you think about, would you eat this? <laughs> so Jenna, I have a question again from Zarek. Zarek, um, he's asking, so are the two lights coming from the same I'm sorry, was the question, are the two lights coming from the same direction? Correct. Right, yes. Um, so that I love to do as well. Um, that's something uh, that I really think about too. Like, again, what's natural, what feels like just right is that like, if I'm gonna have two different styles of light or where I would have two lights come in and one's soft and one's bright, um, it's kind of like if there was the sun, but it had half a cloud coming over it. So, um, so then we have two lights coming from one source, one source being the sun. So just thinking again about what's natural, what could really happen, um, and then just working from there. And so if you wanna see more action or interaction, um, just like taking that into consideration when you're setting up your lights. Oh, you know what they're asking? If you can move the flag so they can see the setup. Sure. More. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. And again, <laughs> also very important to your shots. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, so definitely um, things maybe I didn't mention already, sandbags, the apple boxes are really fantastic. I, are, I have two sets of these and I was already like, I was just telling Jen yesterday, I'm like, I need like at least two more of these to be able to um, just keep things the same height. But then I also have my laptop is on one. I have my, they this are so useful for getting things where they need to be. And um, they're durable enough to be able to like to step on them, which makes them ladders, you know, like it's just like they can be used for anything. So definitely love those Apple boxes. Um, I have a Manfrotto stand here. Um, let's see, I think this ball head was like four, I forgot the, 410. But I also have a gear list too, if you want to check out my website, it's under the resource library that um, I list a lot of these items too. And um, I have also have my video lights listed there and anything else. Um, foam core boards, you guys have all probably all seen them before, but uh, the Flat World makes some great ones that can actually ship to you. These ones are foam core ones that you can get at like an art supply store. Tether tools, tether cords, the best. Um, <laughs> Jen uh, will tell you too, like I have a pretty like, low tolerance for cords, <laughs> not working. Uh, and tether cords and <laughs> tether tools uh, is fantastic. Um, I also have a newfound love for this tether block, which goes in between my camera and the Manfrotto um, ball or the head, really the quick release plate. And then maybe I didn't mention this already, but this is the Photo um, trigger to wirelessly um, tell those lights to flash. Uh, let's see, keep all the things that I'm using pretty close to my set so that I can move stuff around. Um, I, I do keep some other things really close like um, a Kukuloris and other fill cards. I keep all of my gear pretty, pretty close to where I'm shooting because you never know when you're gonna run out of batteries or need a clamp and you can't like go too far without needing the clamp, you probably need it for a reason. <laughs> so all those things. Um, is there any other questions? So the funny thing is you've answered a lot of them during the session. So I don't have a Hi. lot now, but hopefully some will pop up. Um, I also have one from myself because this yeah. is pertinent to what you're doing right now. And what I do usually is I, I don't use flash. I rely on natural lighting for my food photography. And so, I think this is even for me, like what is the benefits of flash in food photography versus natural lighting that you- Yeah, so um, this is such a lovely question because natural light is so beautiful. And ultimately um, for a lot of people, I won't say everyone, but ultimately is the goal to get your light to look like it is a window light and have that beautiful soft directional feel. 
Um, so with artificial light, you can create that um, with a variety of different ways, right? Where, whether it's a soft box or whether it's like um, a light with diffusion, um, either a sheet or like um, they make like a vellum that, on a roll that you can roll out. There's lots of different ways to actually do it, but the actual benefit to it is that you can recreate it time and time again, where you don't have to rely on the time of day. You don't have to rely on um, the time of year. So if, uh, for instance, I'm in the Midwest and in the winter, it can get dark by 430. So if we have an eight hour shoot day, and if I am only shooting uh, with natural light, um, it's going to be dark by the start time. And then it's going to be dark by the time it ends. So I'll have a very small window to actually shoot something to get a similar look and feel. So again, with that being said, um, I only have to use um, a color checker once if I don't change the set. You have to shoot, you have to do it every time you change the set. But say I was shooting a natural light by a window, I would be using this like every five minutes because of how often the light will change temperatures if there's a cloud that comes through. Um, again, the time of day, uh, it will switch up so much. And then you'll often end up times with like partially hard light or partial soft light. Um, and not, you have to work through that really fast. Um, again, I also seen it happen with, um, being a problem with like the first video I shot was using natural light and the color changed so often. And it was such a bear to like, edit because just having to like color correct all the things and they didn't really like line up from scene to scene um, because again a cloud would move and it would get blue and so um ha being able to manipulate your own lights on your own time is invaluable as a commercial food photographer um but also i want to say like there's there are some beautiful benefits to using natural light that you, you can't just plan for, right? Like, so because things are moving, it adds like this element of surprise and problem solving and being resourceful that, um, that you really couldn't recreate, recreate in the same exact way. For instance, there's this one shot on my portfolio. I did a stop motion and I was just shooting something really quick. I like stopped in my, to my studio. I didn't have time to set some lights up because they were already in my van from shooting a location shot. And so I just set something up really quick next to my window. And um, within 30 minutes, I got this um, amazing sequence of images that the sun was setting. And so I have my window and then I have like a, a door kind of next to it that has like a little oval window. And by the time the light went through the main window and then it stopped and then it picked up back around um, to my the door window and it just like brought in all these little like rays of light all in a row so as you like clicked through the stop motion you can see the light setting where i mean i i wouldn't have even thought to do that if i was shooting with artificial light so there's definitely some beautiful things um for both on both sides of that and so to shoot both is is really valuable trait. I actually do have questions coming in now, but I'm gonna ask one more before we end this. But also, yeah. if you guys for the chat, if you have more questions, she, you can follow her site link. She does mentorship programs, one on ones, and she has also you know helpful gear lists suggestions. So, all right, question. Sarah asks, what factors go into your choice of the size of softbox slash modifiers that you use in each shoot? Great right, question. Okay, so I do have definitely some favorites. Um, I tend to like like uh, somewhere around a four foot octobox is like my happy place, but I also really, really enjoy strip boxes. Um, I don't have one here uh, close by, but Essentially, I um, like around a four foot by one foot strip box. Um, I I will like in my, wherever I'm going, I'm gonna pack two of those um, that I can create a rim light if I'm shooting any sort of beverage, or um, it just like adds another level of even if I have a person here, it would add like another like little highlight line to kind of frame out my face. So I have a soft light and then um, kind of two edge lights, and then so a soft box, hard light. 
what, what else I look for in a softbox though would definitely be um, like a double diffusion. I've gotten softbox, I've gotten way too many softboxes, but I can tell you for sure the softboxes that I love, love, love have two layers of diffusion in them and they um, come together very easily. I was an assistant for a long time before I started doing my, um, well, actually while I was building up my first portfolio, but I spent many, many days like putting soft boxes together and just as soon as they made these that, or this one here has, well, this one's a little different, but a lot of them that I have are more like an umbrella and you just like, they just open in seconds and they're just beautiful. No, no time struggling on getting the, the little rod. <laughs> so um, that's, that is what I look for in a soft box. They're integral sometimes. And again, I have more questions from you guys, but I'm going to provide a link to her gear onto the chat box. So check that out. And again, if you have more questions, she's available through her website. We'll throw that link in as well. Yeah. And definitely if you want to um, apply for Portfolio to Profit, uh, we have a ton of fun. It's a very, very special, like tight knit group. Um, and it's, yeah, I would love to see your application come through and we have the link for that we'll drop in. And also I have a free ebook that you can sign up for uh, today as well that we'll try and get the link in here maybe before we close out. But um, definitely message me on Instagram. Um, I would love, love, love to see your guys' um, work come in for the, for the critiques that are, we're doing on Thursday. So I'm gonna be one of the people critiquing your images and you have the chance to win a Fuji camera. So very excited to be part of this food photography week with B&H. Thank you so much. Oh my God. I mean, just listening to your course and I have to like, you know, promote you one more time because you do something that I was listening to and that's offer emotional and mental support to the food photography journey. Yeah. And that's so rare to see because you know, usually you jump in and you're like, this is what you need. This is the gear you need. But, you know, doing it, even myself alone last year, it was so, there was so many highs and lows. So for you to even offer that, that's, I would take that offer. That's amazing. You know, that's so cool to see. So, oh my God. Thank you. Very Thank you so much. Of course. And we're going to, we're going to try to wrap this up. It's so hard because there's so many questions that are coming in for you. So. Okay. Well, let's try and make a copy of them if we can. Yes. And yeah. then I can try to reach out for, to anyone as well. So um, again, please come visit me on Instagram so I can know that you were here. Um, use the BNH hashtag for when you submit your photos. I think it's BH Food Photo Week. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hashtag BH Food Photo Week. And I will repeat it one more time before we leave. But Jenna, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to throw up our schedule again, everyone. I'm going to tell you what's happening this week. We have Maria Perez coming in tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time talking about her cookbook and how she created one during the pandemic, which is amazing. And then we have Alan Shapiro talking about finding Zen and delight with food photography, which even you saw in Jenna's live demo how it is so peaceful and so awesome to get like and so satisfying to get those perfect shots in and when you get them it just feels so gratifying and amazing then Wednesday we have Jessica Duck coming in for so simple yet appealing and Steve Geralt teaching us how to make the perfect pour in another live demo and then finally we, we're closing out the Food Photography Week with a panel of food influencers and creators talking to their craft. We have David Ma, Jessica Hirsch, Remy Park, and they're all wonderful in their own ways. They're going to discuss how they've made it, how they keep up with trends, everything to do with that. And then me and my colleague are going to host the Image Critique. And for that, I'm going to reiterate the sweepstakes that we have coming up. It is for you guys to share your food photos, everything you've learned this week, including today on Twitter, on Instagram, post your photos, put up the hashtag BH food photo week, and then you get a chance to win a 
Fujifilm S XS10 with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens and a memory card from Transcend. We're very excited to work with both of those brands. So yeah, and that's me closing. Don't forget to post your photos and I can't wait to see them. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.